is fuel for your body, your mind, and definitely your sport. But let's face it, nutrition is confusing and the expectations on girls and women to be thin and have a six pack are exhausting. If you've ever been frustrated with your body, confused about nutrition, obsessed with eating healthy or guilty when you don't, under ate, over ate, or overtrained, and overwhelmed with all the pressure, then this podcast is for you. Nutrition can be easy, you can take control of it, but it might start with letting go of control by asking for help and making a change. I'm Lindsay Elizabeth Cortez, sports dietitian and owner of Rise Up Nutrition, where I empower female athletes to overcome nutrition concerns and perform at their highest level, to stop being confused by all the mixed or harmful messages, and finally have confidence in your body as a fierce, fit, and fueled female athlete. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Female Athlete Nutrition Podcast. Today is a super, super special guest for many reasons. The first is that he's actually our first male guest on the Female Athlete Nutrition Podcast. And the reason that I picked this person to be our first male guest is because he holds a very special place in my heart. This is my dad. This is my father. His name is Kevin Fow. I might refer to him as Kevin or dad in this show. I'm not quite sure yet. But he's here to join us. And besides being my amazing dad, I want to share a little bit about him as an athlete as well. So my dad has been an athlete his whole life. When I was a young kid growing up, like very young, I was going to watch his cycling, road cycling races. And then he was a great hockey player. I went to his hockey games. And then when I was in about eighth grade, when my dad was around the age of 44, he ran his first ever marathon, which was the Boston Marathon. And then that has really been a huge part of his life over the past 20 years. He has since his first marathon, he's run, I think, 31 total marathons. He has a PR of a 318, which by the way, he ran at age 53. He has a PR of a 123 half marathon. He's run 14 consecutive Bostons. He is still running and very active and we'll chat about this soon, but the marathon days we believe are, are done now. Sadly, we'll chat about it. But all this to say that my dad is a phenomenal athlete and dad, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you. I don't know about phenomenal, but I appreciate the words anyways. <laughs> well, I think you already know this, but obviously I think you're a great athlete and you've been one of my inspirations growing up. So I definitely want to highlight phenomenal and <laughs> dad to kind of kick us off on this podcast. One of the reasons I thought it'd be really cool to have you as a guest is because, yeah, you're a great athlete yourself. And I think sports have always like run in your in your blood and in your genes a little bit. but I am actually one of three of my father's daughters. So when you first had children and you had three girls, I'm curious, like what were your expectations as a father in signing us up for sports and having three girls all a, kind of all within a similar age group too? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. And I'm going to say something. I, I don't want to come off as being sexist, but you you have to understand you know, my background, where I came from and the time. So I love sports. I love all sports, you know, and I love them for the, the life lessons you gain from them. So when we had you kids, you know, we were, we were going to have you involved in something. I wanted sports. Your mother had other things of interest for you to participate in. And we said, let's get them exposed to everything. And so that you could then choose your own way. As a father, though, and this is where the, the sexist part may come in, you know, I was relatively young when we had your, your older sister, and my expectations of, for girls in sports wasn't to become a professional athlete. They weren't for you to get even a college scholarship. I truly got you involved in it for the fun of sports, for the for the life lessons that you learned, the teamwork, the working, you know, I had no fault vision of, you know, you guys signing a pro contract. So I was a little more mellow in my approach to sports as a young father. I often say, if your older sister, Jody was a boy, I very well could have really messed her up with sports because I'm sure I would have been 
far more aggressive and I don't think I would have necessarily had priorities, you know, properly set. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't think that's sexist, uh, but I, I understand the difference there. And that, I mean, that rings true. All of my soccer games growing up, when you coached me, you always reminded me like, you're out there to have fun. You're out there to have fun. And, and it was so great for you to say that, although I will admit sometimes maybe a little frustrating. Cause I was like, but I want to win. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, and I remember we had a conversation once coming home from uh, gymnastics because, you know, I would drop you off at gymnastic practice and pick you up. And um, you scared me once. I, I had, I think I had dropped you off. No, I actually, it was, uh, we were talking behind your back at home with your sisters and you were at practice and one of your sisters said, dad, you know, Lindsay hates it when you tell her to have fun. And I remember picking you up and we were driving home and I say, Lindsay, you know, your sister say you don't like it when I tell you to have fun. And I remember you snapped back at me and you said, dad, I, you know, I, I go to gymnastics five days a week. I put in, you know, 10 hours a week at it. You know, I want to win. And I, I, you scared me. You honestly scared me because you were there to compete. And I was like, whoa, I got to back off with to just have fun a little bit with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you recall that, that night or not, but it was an interesting one. Yeah. I don't necessarily recall that night, but it sounds about right. You know, cause I, I do remember in those moments being annoyed, which again, thinking back to any preteen, <laughs> you know, or teenager, maybe there's a lot of girls who get annoyed by their fathers, but I remember being annoyed by that. But now as I'm older, I think, wow, what a, what a great lesson you were trying to teach me of just have fun, you know, cause here I am. No, I'm not a professional athlete, but look, look at what everything that sports has given me in my life, both in, you know, my work ethic, my, I don't know, leadership, my ability to work on a team and just, and, and paving the way for my career and everything in sports, like, like sports has given me so much. So, so that message of why are you here? Maybe it's not for the scholarship. Maybe it's not to be a pro athlete, but just, it's still bringing value to my life and have fun while you're doing it. And I appreciate that sentiment now, but definitely at the time, no, I was annoyed. I wanted to win. I was training hard. Yeah. Well, you know, I couldn't just shake it off and say, well, at least it was a fun day at the gym. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, there was more I wanted to accomplish. Yeah. And, and trust me, it wasn't, you know, that sounds good. Me telling you, oh, just have fun. But no, I, I wanted you to succeed as well. In fact, actually, you kind of shifted my attitude a little bit. You know, I, I say I started off that way with Jody and Kristen your sisters, when you came along, I remember one of your first soccer games and the coach of the other team on the sidelines saying, who's that number four? And I was like, oh, that's my daughter. You know, so, so you were, you were into it right from the get go. And yeah, I probably got a little more competitive with you than I did with, with your sisters, you know, and, and, but I'm glad to hear, you know, you did get all the, the, value and benefit out of participating in sports, which I, I believe are great things that lead, you know, life lessons that everyone can benefit from. Yeah. So now for our listeners, so I obviously have two older sisters than me, and then I do have a younger brother who's almost eight years younger than me, about seven and a half years younger. So you were just saying, had you had a firstborn son, maybe you would have had a different approach with him, but you did eventually have a son was, was your approach towards Michael, that's his name for our listeners, was your approach towards Mike and his participation in sports any different? Or also, since this was so many years later, you know, was it kind of the same? I believe it was different because, again, I think, I think you girls mellowed me a little bit. And now I was a little older and wiser. I, I want to give myself credit. But, you know, so with him... I probably pushed him a little more. Now he had a different personality. You know, all, all four of you have different personalities. As you know, Mike, Michael is a little more reserved. He's quiet. I had to, I had to push him a little bit. I don't know how to describe it. So I, I did push him a little bit more. He has a very laid back approach to sports. He was very good. He ended up focusing on hockey and, you know, played in at the Boston Garden for the state championship his senior year. So he had a ver very good, you know, athletic career. He, he wasn't into running. I know we're going to focus on running a little bit here, but I, I think he just 
tired of being dragged around to all your track meets where he's just not motivated to be a runner. But he, um, again, I, I knew I wasn't out to make him a pro athlete and I wasn't out even to get him a college scholarship. Did I want him to, you know, make his varsity teams in high school so that he could have that experience of competing at the high school level? Absolutely. And so I, I pushed him a little bit to make sure that he accomplished at least that level of, of participation. Seems like less of a, a daughter versus son thing and more of just a personality thing of how you, you know, that that's a very good observation because yeah, I treated you differently than I treated your two sisters. Courts. And, and then I also had to treat Michael differently. And, and yeah, so I, I think that's an important thing as I, as I talk to you, I recognize that. No, I, I, and I, even within the teams that we've, we've participated in, you know, the teams we coach, every kid is different and, and you got to figure out what motivates them and how to push them and, you know, how to get them to set their own dreams and then go after them. Yeah. And I want to shift gears and talk about that because besides being a great athlete yourself and, and of course being my dad, you've been a coach based like a lot of your life. I don't know. I don't know that when the earliest days that you coached were, but as your daughter, I mean, you were coaching me in soccer by, oh gosh, was it fifth grade that you started coaching our soccer team, which is the blizzards? Uh, yeah. I, I think I was coaching you in second grade, second possibly. Grade. Pot, yeah, yeah, pot, yeah, I think you're right. So you, you know, my dad was my soccer coach all the way up to until high school. He coached my sisters as well in soccer. And now he's also a certified running coach. And I didn't mention this in his intro, but he is an assistant cross country coach with our, a local high school. So yeah, going back to like kind of coaching and let's let's focus on coaching a female team, an all-female team like you did with my soccer team growing up. What were some lessons learned as a male coach for an all-female team? Well, you know, first I, I'll go back to the same lesson that I had for each of you individually. I wanted all the kids on the team to have fun. You know, so, so yes, I wanted to win. I wanted, you know, everyone to experience the thrill of winning. I wanted everybody on the team to experience the satisfaction of working hard for something and then seeing the results. But again, you're dealing with, you know, a bunch of little girls. Not everyone is, was athletic. Not everyone was motivated. And, and you have to find that balance and, and get them all working as a team. It, it was an interesting group. I also recognized early on that just because someone was athletic or, or appeared to be athletic when they were eight or nine years old did not mean they were going to continue to be athletic and, and make it in high school sports. And just because someone was not athletic, and probably this is more important, someone who wasn't athletic when they were six or seven or eight years old that doesn't mean that they didn't have a future in the sport. And, it's, and when you talk about kids growing and developing at, at different paces, you know, I was not going to throw away the future of a, a little seven-year-old, you know, gangly kid, you know, who, who wasn't the best athlete at that time who might be able to develop and grow into someone and end up playing high school sports, if that makes sense. It does. And I'm hearing you say over and over again, like the value of high school sports. And I want to hear more about your passion for, for sports at that age, whether it's from your own personal experiences or, or from kids that you've coached us, including why, why do you think that age and that time period for sports is so important? Well, for probably 99% of your athletes out there, your organized sports end in high school. You know, the, the average person does not go on to compete in college. So high school is the epitome of organized team sports. Okay. Runners. Yeah. You can go on and, you know, run on club teams and whatnot, road races, etc. Hockey. You can join your beer league, you know, and, and skate once a week with your buddies, but you know, high school sports is the, you know, that's, that's it for the majority of your athletes. So you know, I, I actually feel bad for, and, and it happens a lot more so with boys, some boys who don't develop as quickly, you know, they, they miss out on their high school years just because they, you know, they did not mature at the right time 
if you will. They're not necessarily going to walk on to a college hockey team, you know, if, if, you know, they may have had the skill and the strength and everything by the time they're in college, but if, if they didn't have it in high school, unfortunately, their time may have passed them by. Yeah. Yeah. I hear what you're saying about boys definitely developing and we're thinking kind of stages of puberty and like getting testosterone and some things that are really needed for, for a boy to excel and make it to that next level. And then, you know, what I was thinking about and kind of the flipped version, the female version of that is it breaks my heart when I see girls dropping out of sport because so many girls get insecure about their bodies or their body changes that go on in high school. So the girl's body changes in high school is more like, oh my gosh, now I'm gaining weight or I have this thing called a period and I don't know what to deal with it. And then they're dropping out of sport in high school. And yeah. And so I think kind of both on the male and female perspective of it is, you know, I don't know if, if any way that you can to stay participating in high school sports, because it is kind of like you said, it's the epitome of team sports. And and then you go on to be an adult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But let, let's talk about your your adult organization sports because obviously yeah no more team sports you did play in that beer league hockey like you mentioned for a while and then dad it wasn't until it was age 44 that you ran your first marathon am i correct correct yeah so this is far beyond high school so what hit you well so i had gotten away from the running scene so you know i stopped competitive running my sophomore year in college when i got hurt and you know, I, I I would still go out to work out, but I, I stopped running competitively. Kids came along. I get, I had gotten into cycling and, you know, I, I was riding more and more and I ended up joining a road racing team and I was a cat four racer. So cycling became my sport. And as you mentioned, you know, we would, you know, throw the bike on, on the top of the car and mom would pack you and your sisters into the car and off would go to a race. So I was into my, my cycling running came back when your older sister went out for the track team, her freshman year, I did not encourage her to go out specifically for track. You know, we, we did encourage her that she was going to be doing sports. And so she went out for the track team. And next thing you know, I'm at a track meet. I don't know if you know this or recall this, but the first race that she ran, she ran the 800 meters and she won it. You know, I honestly had not thought of your sister as a fast runner, no disrespect intended, but all of a sudden I got pretty excited about the fact that she won her first race. And I think I came home and went out for a run that night. And so I started, you know, getting back into the running scene with your sister running. I started going to some road races, seeing, you know, some, some folks that I hadn't seen in 20 plus years and boom, I was back into running. The other thing that ties in with this as you're aware, your listeners are not. I I am very goal oriented. So I have my list of lifetime goals. And I used to try to have you all sit down on New Year's Day with me and write down some goals for the year. And on my list was run a marathon. And I had written that down back when I was in college, when I was a competitive runner, I I did want to give the marathon a go, but I, I got away from the running scene. And so I, I never pursued that goal, but I left it on my list all these years. So it was Christmas of 2003. You guys bought me a book, Marathoning for Mortals. And I remember, you, I don't know who put the handwritten note in there, but they said, Dad, if you're ever going to cross uh, running a marathon off your list of lifetime goals, you're not getting any younger, so you better get to it. <laughs> so I read the book, talked to a few friends. I was like, geez, do you think I can go after this? And so I, I I did. I, I ran in the 2004 Boston Marathon. I ran as a bandit and I ran for a charity, but it was a bandit. And, and before any of your listeners totally get disgusted with me, you need to understand that back then, running Boston as a bandit was, was not a bad thing. You know, I'm not saying Boston encouraged bandits, but they didn't discourage them and they gave you full support. You know, Unlike a city where they, they pull you out if you're a bandit. It's a New England tradition. You know, everybody in every town and in, in neighborhood in, in New England has somebody in their neighborhood who used to train through winter and was going to run Boston, you know, as a bandit. That all changed, um, sadly, with the bombing. You know, the world has changed. But I ran it in 2004 as a, as a bandit. And actually, I need to correct myself. I, I used to, 
I couldn't say I ran it because 2004, it hit almost 90 degrees. I thought I was going to die out there and I walked quite a bit of it. And so I was not satisfied and I didn't feel like I could cross that off my list of, of lifetime accomplishments. So I had to go back again, which I did in 2005, did it again for the charity. And I was able to say I, I ran every step of the way. But the competitor in me still wasn't satisfied. So now I, I wanted to qualify for Boston. And uh, that became my passion. And, you know, I ended up running 14 consecutive. Yeah. Yeah. And after that, qualified. Yes. Yeah. Con- consecutively as well. Yeah. I want to go back to that first Boston Marathon in 2004 because I do remember it. I must have been, oh gosh, maybe a freshman in high school, maybe younger. I think a freshman. Yeah. I was a freshman in high school, but anyways, you know, I really, I was a runner at that time. I was on the track team, but I was not a long distance runner. I really didn't really have a concept of like what running a marathon would entail. We saw you training all winter. You did a lot of treadmill training that year, which is crazy. But, you know, this is, we're in Massachusetts in the winter time. You have to do all that training and it's like, gosh, it was a lot. And then you had given us some sort of marker as to when you thought you'd finish around. And my my family, me, my mom, my siblings, we were all, you know, camped out at mile marker 24, which was with a lot of the charity people that you were running with. And we we're watching the clock thinking, you know, dad should be coming by any minute now. Dad should be coming by any minute now. I don't know how long we were waiting, but this, we, <laughs> oh gosh, I think we were nervous, but at the same time, it was our first experience of really watch trying to follow somebody in the marathon. And um, again, this was before all the fancy tracking apps. So like, we really didn't know where you were. So we're watching every single person come by us, every person, a person, person. And yeah, that was a hot year. <laughs> took a while, but you did it. Yeah. We were waiting forever and forever and forever. And like, where is he? What, didn't he train for this? What's going on? <laughs> No, I remember a, uh, a very good friend of mine, running friend from town, who had run, well, I don't know how many Bostons at that time. He he ended up running over 20 Bostons. But he came up to me before the, the race in Hopkinton, and he said, Kevin, he goes, you know, I know you have your goals, but be careful out there. He goes, it, it's going to be bad. I didn't listen to him. I, I went out. I started running at the pace I felt I could accomplish. And, you know, I'm running along, I'm, I'm feeling absolutely horrible. And I remember it was somewhere around the mid, midway point. I, I, I could actually feel and hear the Gatorade sloshing around oh. in my stomach. Oh. And then shortly after that, I remember getting the chills. And, and then I'm thinking to myself, it's almost 90 degrees. I shouldn't have the chills. This is not good. This was dangerous, quite honestly. And, and it just went downhill from there. It was, it was, it was a brutal run. Yeah. And I also, I want to put this in perspective for some of our listeners who aren't familiar with like Boston weather is, you know, it's 90 degrees. That's hot for any runner, first of all, but like first that, you know, I live in Texas now, you know, some marathons are run in Arizona, but it's one thing when you're like training and you're acclimated. But the thing about the Boston marathon is you train throughout the winter. You train in 10, 15, 20 degree weather or half the time it's snowing outside. So you have to train on a treadmill and then for it to suddenly randomly be 90 plus degrees on marathon day for my dad's first ever marathon. That was, oh gosh, what a, what a memory. But like you said, the competitor in you, you know, because you did walk that actually didn't accomplish your goal. You're like, no, I said I want to run a marathon. So you go back the next year, you do run a marathon but competitor and you said, wait, I can run a marathon faster. So <laughs> tell us a bit about what the last, you know, 20 years of, of running has meant to you because you've invested a lot into it, into the sport, into the marathons over the past 20 years. Well, it, it did become a, a lifestyle that, you know, took, took over the family. You know, everyone in the family has been a runner. You know, even Michael, you know, although he's he's not by definition a runner, he's gotten out there and, and has done some races with us. So it, it has been a huge part of the family. You know, personally, you know, in my career, there's a there's a there's a quote. I well, I'm not gonna get the quote right. There's a saying 
something to the effect of, you know, if you have some problems and you can't figure them out on a 20 mile run, then you're not going to, you're not going to get the answer to that problem. <laughs> you know, in, in my professional work career, you know, I'd go out for my long runs and I'd have an issue that I was, I was grappling with. And uh, it would be absolutely amazing where, you know, on the run, the answers would come to me. There'd be personal issues that we may be dealing with, you know, in the house. Again, you go off for that long run, there's something that occurs, you know, you know, in your chemistry and in your brain where things would be clearer to me. And, and you know, a lot of answers to problems would, would come to me on the runs. I, I loved my long runs, you know, with my current situation with the knee. You know, I don't have my long runs and I, I do miss those. It, it was a form of meditation for me. And, and my f- circle of friends right now are my running buddies. I had great training partners over the years. You know, there was a spell at work my last couple of years at at my primary job that put the roof over our heads and fed you girls. I wasn't happy there my last couple of years. And and I recall I'd be, you know, on my third cup of coffee in the kitchen and I'd I'd grumble something about going into work and and mom would say, uh, well, don't forget you go for your run at lunchtime with your running buddies and boom, it would pick up my day. Cause we, we, I had a great training group and would go for, you know, our, our lunchtime run every day at work. So yeah, running is a, a huge part of, of my life. Yeah. One thing that probably hasn't been a part of your life so much has probably been nutrition. I admire you as an <laughs> athlete dad, but I can't say I ever <laughs> looked up to your eating habits per se. For the most part, you you would eat what, what my mom would cook for you, which my mom cooks wonderful meals and we've been grateful our whole lives for that. When would you say that you first became aware though that nutrition impacted your performance as an athlete? Yeah, no, um, you're absolutely right. If it wasn't for mom's cooking, who knows where I'd be. She would keep a nice balanced meal in front of us every every night, okay? So I didn't have to worry about it. I do recall one thing, and I, you'll probably remember this one. I had watched some some show. It had to do with Olympic training in the you know, Olympic Center in Colorado, and it had to do with nutrition, but I, I didn't understand that stuff. But I do recall one thing that came out of it, and I, I started walking around the house, and you guys would be talking food, and I would say, you know, I don't eat for pleasure. I eat for survival. I don't know if you remember that or not. Oh, I remember you saying this. Of course I do. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and and, and trust me, I, I do like food, but I, I can't get into watching, you know, cooking shows. And, you know, I'm, uh, I, I'm not, I don't have the patience for cooking. I, you know, if I can't microwave it, you know, if mom goes away to visit you girls and I'm home alone, she either has to prepare the food or I'm in trouble. You know, so I, I, I enjoy what she cooks, but that's not the highlight of my, my day. I'm not into food that way. Going back to your question, when I was cycling, I do recall somewhere along the line, somebody turning me on to recovery drinks. Again, you have to understand with my age, you know, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. We didn't even have Gatorade, Okay. In fact, drinking water during sports sometimes was perceived as a weakness. You didn't take water, you know, on your runs. We didn't have Gatorade. I do recall football practices in the heat and we'd take salt tablets, you know, with our water and that that would be it. But even there, you didn't want to volunteer that you needed to take a water break because that was a sign of weakness. When I first started running the marathons, I don't know if you recall this, when you were at mile 24 waiting, do you recall what you were waiting with to give me? Food? Soda, Coke, flat Coke. Coke, flat diet, flat Coca-Cola. I wanted sugar, but I didn't want the carbonation. That's the generation that I'm from. You know, you wanted the sugar, no carbonation. And so hand me, you know, a a flat Coca-Cola. I do remember. Yep. And God forbid, if you didn't have it ready to hand to me, I'd be furious. Okay? But I do recall in cycling, somebody turned me on to a recovery drink. And I can clearly recall, you know, I, I would always have heavy, sore legs, you know, after a good, hard workout, cycling workout. And so the day after, you know, it would, it would take a, a few miles for the legs to loosen up. And I recall drinking, you know, this recovery drink. And I, I went out for a ride after a hard workout. I was like, Wow, my legs aren't heavy and sore, and and I I actually recall that, and so that was when I got turned on to recovery drinks. 
I still, I'm still not good at nutrition, as you know, but I did, you know, while I was running, I had a very hard, high carbohydrate diet and which was fine because I, I love my spaghetti. But then I, for, for my marathons, I did get into carbo loading. And, and so, you know, I was focused on, on that, but I, you know, I, I was not good with balancing my carbs and my proteins and yeah, I'm not good with my nutrition. Yeah. Well, and I do think though you have learned quite a bit over the years and I think it's probably thanks to running that you have started paying attention, especially probably more so with specifically your performance nutrition, maybe not overall health nutrition, but just performance nutrition. I remember getting a phone call with you when I was in grad school and you, you tried I don't know if you were asking me or telling me, but you were definitely talking to me about carb loading and reaching, you know, a certain percentage of your diet of carbs because you read about how it's supposed to help you. And, you know, and mind you at this time, I wasn't a marathon runner myself at that time, but I was still thinking like, oh, now he's going to ask me a question. (laughs) (laughs) But I think that was really great that even though, you know, you, you, weren't the quote unquote foodie, like perhaps me and my sisters, my mom, we really enjoy eating food. And, and uh, like you said, you eat for survival. But I think when it came to your running, you did get more into it of, okay, well, how can I fuel my body? You started carb loading for races. You always did well packing your fuel, your gels and your hydration for long runs. I think you always did that. So whatever you learned in the seventies, you definitely changed that mindset because you were always hydrated on your long runs, at least what I've seen. Well, and, and I had to, you know, when I, when I first started running marathons, I, I used to pride myself on, you know, the, the mental fortitude of hanging in there when I hit the wall. Okay. I, I would hit the wall and bonk bad. I could run 20 miles with anybody. And then it was a case of survival. And my, my first few marathons, they were ugly finishes. Okay. And if you look at my splits, you know, again, I, I could run 20, but you could always see when I hit the wall and then it was a game of survival. And I, again, I used to pride myself on, you know, hanging in there and making it. When I learned how to properly fuel for the marathon, quite honestly, the marathon experience was a lot more pleasurable. Yeah. <laughs> it is not pretty when you bonk in a marathon, trust me. You know, so so that proper fueling for a marathon, I had to learn the hard way. But when I learned it, it was it was good. Do you think that was the shift? And when maybe you know, maybe when you started to PR and things like that. I mean, you brought your time down at age fifty three. You ran a three eighteen, and I don't know if people listening to this think that's impressive, but daughter over here thinks it's impressive that at age fifty three you ran a three eighteen marathon you know, that must have been with proper fueling, I would assume, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure when, I'm not sure when I started making the successful journey through, you know, bonking, if you will. But it, you know, I'm, I'm, I apologize. I'm trying to think if my first Boston qualifier, how that one went. I, I wasn't into the three-day carbo loading then. So I, I think I learned how to better fuel, qualified for Boston. But then as I wanted to continually get better, that's when I was looking for any way to get better. And and the fueling became probably the most important thing. I, I couldn't run more hours in the week there. You know, I had a limited amount of time that I could run. I did lose weight. So yes, running lighter in the marathon has its benefits, but I'm very, very careful with what I say there because you don't want to, you don't want to create a problem for yourself. There's a healthy there somewhere. I had weight to lose though. So, so I, my nutrition became better. I lost some weight and I learned how to fuel better. Yeah, for sure. And I want to, I just want to share a memory. I don't know that we really have anything to say about it, but (laughs) I just want to share a memory that for our listeners that actually my first marathon that I ran, I ran with, with my dad and it was probably sort of at at maybe the peak of, of your running as well. So you flew down to Florida 
we trained separately, but you flew down to Florida where I was living and you paced me for a marathon. It was my first marathon ever. Dad, just like being a kid where he says, just have fun. That was basically your message to me was, this is your first marathon. Your only goal is to complete it and have fun. And in typical Lindsay fashion, the week of the race, I said, no, dad, I want to qualify for Boston. (laughs) And he said, I remember you saying something like, I don't think you've really been training at that level yet, Lindsay. You know, it was my, I only trained for like three or four months and it was my, you know, here I was going from sprinter status to marathon almost overnight. And yeah, so dad was saying, your goal is just to finish and have fun. I said, no, I want to qualify for Boston. And I don't know how much you doubted me, but we came pretty darn close, didn't we? We were two minutes off. Two, two minutes off. Two minutes. And no, I do, I do remember you calling. I don't know if it was like two weeks before. It was it was way too close. You made the comment, no, Dad, I do want to qualify. And I remember hanging up the phone and saying something to your mom. And your mom's like, you know, you're always jealous of the, the young kids who pass you late in the race. Just let her run. You know, just let her go. So it's like, all right, we'll we'll run together. We'll see if we can pull this off. And you did a great job. You know, it was those last couple miles that you faded just a little bit because you were on, you were on pace, I think, 21, 22 miles. Those last couple that we, we just let it slip a little bit. But then, I don't know, you ran away from me in the final mile. And uh, it was, this isn't fair. You know, I paced you all this way and I, I couldn't keep up with you in the last mile. Yeah, I I hardly remember fading around mile two, but I definitely remember, you know, mile 25 and 26 where didn't matter that you carried me the whole way. I (laughs) I sprinted it in (laughs) and I let my my youth genes finish finish, uh, ahead of you at the finish line. But it was a good memory to run my first marathon with with my dad. I, I always wished I could run Boston with him, but, you know, maybe maybe someday I'll run it and you'll be cheering on the sidelines more for you. Yeah, I'll definitely be on the sidelines, but you know, I still haven't given it up and maybe I'll, I'll find a way to figure out somehow to get back there, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we, we've mentioned, you know, you've been running for the last 20 years. You recently had a knee, a knee surgery, and that's why we're saying maybe marathons are, are done for you. Do you have any, are you setting any goals? You mentioned you're a very goal oriented person. I know this. Are you setting any performance goals or, you know, what does your relationship with running look like now after having this surgery? And yeah, what are some of your thoughts? Yeah. So with, you know, I won't bore you with all the details of what's going on with the knee, but you know, it's not from running. I will, you know, when folks know me and they know my running and they know I'm hurting now, I'm very quick to point out it's not running. Running kept me going. I had ACL surgery years ago from a hockey injury. And with that, I knew arthritis was coming and I, I have a near full defect on the femur where the, the cartilage is, is worn out. So yeah, the knee's gone downhill since 2017. Preparing, preparing for Boston is, is when it really started hurting me. And I've had two surgeries since. The last surgery, they also, um, I did have a torn meniscus. So they took some of that out. Where I'm at now, I I can only run every other day, three to five miles. So I'm grateful to be able to go out and run. Uh, you know, I'm missing that long run and the, the psychological effect and benefits that the long run brings me. I was still hanging in there competing for a while, but it's if you don't put the miles in, it, it it's not going to happen. So I've shifted my goals, you know, at the age of 61 now, I want to try and and make myself a a miler if I can. So if I can only get out for three to five miles, I'm going to, you know, I'm changing my workouts where I'm going to see if I can be a a regional. You get to be my age, you also rely on something called the age graded calculator that's out there, which basically time. So I'm out to keep myself as a regionally rated miler. So that's my goal to maximize my training, whether or not, you know, I can deal with this knee and get the miles back up there and get myself back to doing a marathon someday, perhaps, but I I don't have any false vision of of being competitive like I used to be in the marathon. Yeah. But still running and, and maybe looking at something different, like the mile. I like that. Do you think that you're seeing as, you know, we've kind of joked on your nutrition a little bit, but then highlighted that. You, you did dial it in for your performance. Like, 
Do you think that you'll depend on or think about nutrition any differently as as your performance goals change or as you enter like a new a different chapter or stage in your life? Absolutely. In fact, you know, I need some some advice from you. <laughs> so with the surgery and decrease of miles, I have put some weight on. You know, if one were to look at me, they they wouldn't say, Oh, that guy's overweight. I'm probably at 20 pounds more than my marathoning days, but you know, some of the weight's healthy weight. But I, you know, so I I I do need to do something where, you know, I, I look at my, my, my intake, my balance and my nutrition, and I make sure that it's proper for, for my situation, if that sounds right. You know, I'm, I'm not going to be at marathon weight and I don't need to be at marathon weight and I, I want to be a healthy weight, but I don't know what that is for myself right now with this change. You know, I, I knew what a good healthy weight was for running marathons the way I wanted to. I don't know what the right healthy weight is for what I'm doing now. Yeah. And I think that's okay. And even as a dietitian and your daughter, I will say we, I wouldn't even know, right? Like I think this is the trouble that so many people face when they are going through transitions and we're too quick to try and change something and say, well, let me try and get to this weight or, you know, let me try and eat how I was before. But we do have to respect, wait, I'm in a different phase. I'm a different age. I'm doing something different. And so I think, you know, step number one is probably just be aware of what things are changing and and give yourself the space and time to figure that out without setting any hard and fast, you know, goals on yourself. Like you said, you don't need to be at what you're PR marathon weight was when we're a few years after that injured and not marathoning, right? So trying to redefine what is right for my body right now. And I think it will take a little bit of time to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, dad, this has been a fun conversation. Has, was this your first podcast ever? This was, yes. <laughs> Well, you did great. This is my last. <laughs> you did good. I do have some uh, rapid fire questions that I like to ask all of my guests at the end of the show. So, Dad, if you could have one food every single day for the rest of your life and never get sick of it, what would that be? Spaghetti and meatballs. Good old every day. traditional. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And then. I'm guessing your favorite sport to participate in is running, but what would you say? Is that your favorite participation sport? No, you know, and and you told me you were going to ask that question. Actually, hockey, you know, hockey and skating is just, it's a, it's a beautiful sport. It's, you know, combination of speed and skill. It's, I, I love skating. I love skating. Yes, I love my running. I love cycling, but hockey, you know, playing hockey is probably number one. I love it. What about spectator sport, your favorite sport to watch? Spectator, you know, throw in, and, and now this may sound odd, but watching marathons and watching the Tour de France, especially, you know, the mountain stages. And, and some people will say, you know, how, how can you sit there and watch, you know, a three hour s- stage at a Tour de France? But, you know, I love, or, you know, a, a two hour marathon. I love watching the tactics. I love the, the changes in the race where, you know, someone may be hurting and you think they're out of it and then they get back into it, you know, so, so I love watching marathons and the Tour de France on TV. Yeah. Interesting. And it, probably a curveball question for you, but how many, or not how many, but if you could name one female athlete that you really admire, who would that be and why? Um, other than your mother and you three girls, of course, <laughs> I, I would say Des, Des Linden, her story is amazing. And when you, I love the story of the 2011 Boston marathon where she lost by two seconds. I know. And I remember reading about her being, you know, her, her talking about that, that defeat. And while you would think your average person would be satisfied finishing second in the Boston marathon. You know, that, that is unbelievable. She must've been, but she wasn't happy, you know, and, and the way she put it, you know, she, she put her heart and soul and everything about her was committed to winning the Boston marathon. And she came up short, you know, by two seconds, it was devastating. And yet what's the rest of the story? 
you know, seven years later, in possibly the worst conditions that the Boston Marathon was ever won in, run in, she won it. You know, and I, I just think that is an incredible story. So Des Linden is is my female athlete. Yeah, she she's definitely amazing. And I think a lot of athletes resonate with that when people are like, you should be happy for second place. And it's, you know, in some ways we can be grateful maybe later on, but definitely in those moments, it's, you know, you go out to win. But Des Linden is definitely a, a winner in so many regards. So, well, thank you, Dad, so much for being on the show, sharing your story. And it was so much fun. All right. I appreciate it. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that episode interviewing my dad, a little bit of insight to my family and my personal life. It was a lot of fun. You know, one thing that I didn't really hit on too much that I would like to right now is just how great of a coach my dad is. We talked about how he coached me in soccer and how he does coach high school cross country runners. And he actually does his own coaching for running on the side as well. As you've heard, he's extremely experienced. He is a certified running coach. And if you are interested in any sort of advice or guidance with your running plan, whether it's your first 5K or trying to speed up your marathon, then I honestly have to give a shout out to my dad. You can find him at simplifiedrunning.wixsite.com. And he's helped many people run their PRs, maybe not professional level athletes, but certainly those of us who really just run for fun and want to see how fast we can go and what the best we can do is. So I will include my dad's contact information, how to reach out to him in the show notes. And I also want to encourage you, if you are a runner yourself, that I do have some fueling guides specific to runners, whether you are a high school and college runner or an adult runner, you can head to my website, again, included in the show notes, www.riseupnutritionrun.com. And I have free ebooks for how to fuel your run. So check out that information in the show notes. Thank you for listening. And of course, thanks dad. Love you.